In this peaceful countryside lies the hamlet of Victoria Bridge near Strabane. Last November, it became the setting of a clinical and deadly SAS ambush. A special branch agent had informed the police there was to be an attack on a part-time soldier's home. There was no danger to him or his family, they'd been moved out. The SAS lay in wait for the attack. They knew it would come from a car at around midnight. They'd covered all the exits. As the car drove by, a gunman in the back seat fired six shots. The SAS now had legal justification to shoot them dead. As the driver sped away in panic, he misjudged a sharp bend, careered across a main road and slewed to a halt on the verge. He sat tight. A minute later, an SAS man ran up to the car and fired a single shot through his head. The driver died instantly. According to the RUC, who revealed very little detail about the incident, a gun attack was launched on the bungalow and the soldiers returned fire. To the outside world, the incident was just another exchange of fire between terrorists and the army. But there'd been a terrible and costly blunder. Only the RUC know how the SAS justified the killing of the driver, but it's most unlikely he was posing a threat to them when they shot him. The driver himself was working for the security forces. His name was Alex Patterson, pictured here at a family christening a few days before he died. We have learned that he was the special branch undercover agent who tipped off the police about the attack in the first place. When things went wrong and his car crashed, Patterson didn't run away like the gunman with him. He waited in the car, apparently certain he could surrender safely. Instead, he was shot at close range in the head. We understand there was consternation in the RUC that the SAS had killed one of their most valuable agents in the Irish National Liberation Army. The death of Alex Patterson is one of seven recent killings by the army that Panorama has investigated. Most of the victims were innocent of any terrorist crime. In every case, we've found disturbing new evidence, and it casts doubt on the army's official version of events. These killings may not unduly trouble people in Britain, but here in Northern Ireland, they're increasingly seen as encouraging terrorism rather than defeating it. There is a shoot-to-kill policy, undoubtedly, undeniably, on the part of the IRA. They shoot to kill without warning uh, and without any pretense of, of, of rule of law. Uh, but you cannot defeat people outside the law by oneself stepping outside the law. The security forces are there to enforce the law, to uphold the law, and to earn credibility for the law. Respect for law is a precondition of the ending of paramilitary attacks against the forces of law. Since the outbreak of violence in Northern Ireland, soldiers have shot dead about 200 people in disputed circumstances. By disputed, we mean the shooting of civilians innocent of any terrorist crime or terrorist suspects who were unarmed or who weren't given a chance to surrender. It's because soldiers live with the constant fear of terrorist attack that the government's defence of them has always seemed a compelling one. I think it is only right to remind the House of the often dangerous circumstances of Northern Ireland, circumstances in which we expect the security forces to evaluate a situation judge the risks to their own lives and those of others, and act appropriately within the law, often in a matter of seconds or less. We should not underestimate the difficulties they face. But for eight years now, members of the government-appointed Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights in Northern Ireland have been telling Secretaries of State that justification doesn't always stand up, even when dealing with real terrorists. I have no objection at all, personally or, or legally, to shooting a terrorist who is presenting an immediate threat to somebody else's life. I think it's, it's right and proper that terrorists who are presenting that kind of threat should be shot dead in order to protect life. Uh, my worry is that 
the law is being used to justify shooting to kill in circumstances in which it would have been possible on the information available to the security forces to arrest. But the vast majority of people in this country, and I dare say most people in England, would give three cheers uh, to the army. Well, I think those chairs would, would be misplaced if uh, those people really wanted to see uh, a diminution of the conflict here. The difficulty with shooting members of paramilitary bodies dead in doubtful circumstances is that there is likely to be a reaction among those people in the community who uh, have sympathies with them. The army's killing of this loyalist terrorist has turned him into a hero amongst some Belfast Protestants. Brian Robinson was in the outlawed Ulster Volunteer Force. At first glance, the case provides a classic example of the kind of life and death decision that soldiers have to face. Robinson set out on the back of a motorbike, armed and with orders to kill a Catholic. He found him shopping and shot him nine times in the back. A 38-year-old Catholic, Paddy McKenna, was walking with a woman and her two-year-old daughter past the Ardoin shops when two gunmen rode alongside on a motorbike. The passenger got off and opened fire, knocking over the child in his attempts to get closer to his target. Robinson was chased from the scene by undercover soldiers from the 14th Intelligence Unit. Within moments, their Vauxhall Astra had rammed his bike and they'd shot him dead. At the time, few doubted the shooting of Robinson was justified. After all, the soldiers had just seen him kill in cold blood. It's only when the statements of the soldiers are tested against other evidence that questions arise about whether Robinson did pose an immediate threat to life. Could he have been arrested? The army have refused to discuss this case or any other case we've investigated. However, we have learned how the two soldiers who killed Brian Robinson justified the shooting to the police. One soldier says that Robinson pointed his gun at their Vauxhall Astra as they chased him down the Crumlin Road. That's disputed by a witness who doesn't want to be named, but who has given a statement to the police. He was driving down the Crumlin Road a few yards behind Robinson's getaway motorbike until it crashed here at the bus stop. Did he at any time turn round and point a weapon at the soldiers chasing him? As far as I'm concerned, i never seen any weapon at all being pointed. I didn't see him turning around on the motorcycle either. But were you in a position to see what Robinson was doing all the time he was um, going down the Crumlin Road? Yeah, yeah. I was right behind the Astra, the whole length of the Crumlin Road, and at no stage did Robinson turn around on the motorcycle. You know that uh, the soldier has the soldier driving the Astra has claimed that Robinson turned round and pointed a weapon at him. You don't think that's true? No. In my opinion, that's lies. By studying a police map and the report of a consultant pathologist who's reviewed the post-mortem evidence, we've worked out what happened next. As the Astra hit the motorbike, Robinson was thrown onto the bonnet. As it skidded to a halt next to the bus stop, he was propelled forward onto the pavement. His gun spun away, so he was now unarmed. This may not have been immediately apparent to the soldier on the passenger's side, a woman. She fired, but missed. Robinson, perhaps disorientated by his fall, now moved towards the bus shelter. As he approached, it should have been clear that he was unarmed because his hands were empty. The woman soldier, however, fired twice more. As Robinson emerged from behind the shelter, she fired a fourth shot. It hit him near his spine and he collapsed to the ground. Medical evidence suggests Robinson was incapable of escaping any further. According to the report of a Belfast consultant pathologist, Dr. Derek Carson, the female soldier's bullet that lodged near Robinson's spine may have caused temporary paralysis of his legs. The other soldier now moved in close for the coup de grace. He fired several shots into Robinson's head, even though he was defenseless and injured. 
The soldier told the police that Robinson had tried to raise himself up and that his hand had moved towards his waistband as if going for a gun. This police photograph does not support the soldier. It shows Robinson's hands were well away from his waistband when he was finished off. I thought he was actually dead before the shot at him because he didn't seem to make any movement whatsoever. Do you think the soldiers were justified in shooting him? No, no, I think in my opinion he could have been arrested because he was going nowhere, he was doing nothing, he was lying on the ground. It wouldn't have taken much to arrest him. The most telling public criticism of the army's killing of Robinson, a Protestant terrorist, came from Ireland's leading Catholic. Last month, Dr. Cahill Daly was created a cardinal by the Pope. Dr. Daly said he didn't believe the army had used the regulation minimum force. His words carry weight because of his denunciation of terrorism, both IRA and loyalist. I didn't find clear proof that the soldiers in question were under imminent threat to their own lives uh, and that uh, it, it was a case in which this use of force was justified. Was there not some way in which the person in question could have been apprehended? Was it necessary to shoot and kill? At the inquest into the SAS's killing of three unarmed IRA terrorists in Gibraltar, it emerged that the army believes shooting someone in the head on the ground could be described as using minimum force. The SAS's tactical commander said, Only by a shooting in the head and only by piercing the brain can one put a stop to all movement. The use of the coup de grace is at the heart of another controversial shooting in Northern Ireland by soldiers from the same undercover unit who finished off Brian Robinson with shots to the head. In January 1990, two soldiers from the 14th Intelligence Unit shot dead three small-time crooks as they robbed a betting shop in Catholic West Belfast. As they lay on the ground, they were machine-gunned. A continuous line of holes were stitched across their coats. In all, 22 bullets hit them. The speed and aggression of the attack left witnesses numb with shock. So when the turn was on the ground, the most vivid part that I remember was them riddling them. What, the... Riddled them on the ground. They shot them while they were on the ground? Yeah, shot them when they were ready, maybe dead. These young men uh, were triggered into eternity. That distressed me. One actually had to ask, uh, couldn't they have been captured? Did they have to die? But according to two eyewitnesses, one of whom was on his motorcycle, the shooting didn't end when the soldier had emptied his machine gun into the two men. The second soldier walked over and delivered the coup de grace. The other soldier, he came over and stood above, above the two bodies and put two bullets into each body as they were lying on the ground, sort of upper chest and head. That's what shocked me the most because the two guys were obviously already had had it. As I pulled up on the road and looked at the man who had evidently shot the two fellas lying on the ground. He was standing quite confident. He had the machine gun in his hand and he was quite ready to shoot anyone that was about. He wasn't panicking. Right? He just uh, was ready and had seemed to have everything under control. There was no panic. There was no rushing about. Everything went in a very disciplined way. So it was the coldness of it, probably, just a sheer professional execution rather than a shooting out term, but an execution. Controversial though these shootings were, it's the death of the getaway driver, John McNeil, that raises the most important questions. McNeil and his accomplices had driven up in a stolen red car. He stayed in the car as the other men with replica guns ran inside. Moments later, two plain-clothed soldiers drove up behind McNeil. One ran up to the driver's side and fired six shots, some at point-blank range, into his head. The police have not been able to find witnesses to this shooting, but we have. A woman was standing next to McNeil's car, and she says the soldier gave him no chance to surrender. We were walking up the White Rock Road, and then we heard the skids of a car. So we turned around, thought it was joyriders, and there were these two fellas 
One was running up towards us and we heard a shot and I threw myself to the ground and just happened to turn around and see where it was coming from like. And there was this man standing, shooting into the car and like I didn't hear there was any warning, didn't hear nothing. After the shooting had stopped and the fellow was choking on his blood, he was just, he was still in the driver's seat, just sitting there and, and he was leaned over to the layup, just hanging there. Last December, the DPP said the soldier who shot McNeil would not be prosecuted. He didn't say why. We know the soldier thought he'd stumbled upon a heavily armed IRA gang. And as in the Robinson case, he claimed that McNeil had made a movement as if going for a gun. But no gun was ever found, so why should McNeil have made a movement to get something that wasn't there? We understand the IUC and the DPP thought McNeil could have had a gun and that it was removed from the car by a hostile crowd. But that reasoning is flawed. We have traced every person who entered the car before the police arrived. A first aider and a bystander opened the driver's door. They stayed there until the body was removed. A woman hospital worker also went into the back seat. Four men, including a priest, entered the passenger door in succession to see if they could also help McNeil. All seven witnesses state categorically they saw no gun. The first aider was Joe Dowdle. He's by far the most important of these witnesses because he was inside the car all the time. Did you see a weapon in the car? I seen no weapons at all. You had a clear view, obviously, of the inside of the car. Oh, yes, when I was right in uh, beside this man that was shot and uh, right in the front of the car, and I seen no weapon there. Had there been a weapon there, do you think you would have seen one? Um, I would scarcely have missed it. Right, I was in and the man had been slumped over the wheel. I had straightened him up and had a clear view of the passenger seat and the footwell. And there was no obvious weapon there. Had anyone really intended to remove incriminating evidence from the scene, the most obvious item was this replica machine gun magazine which fell from one of the robbers. Yet it's clear no one tried to remove it. Although the DPP's decision not to prosecute was greatly influenced by the suspicion that McNeil had had a gun, this wasn't a point the IUC pursued further. They interviewed six out of our seven witnesses, but only two say the police questioned them in any detail about whether they'd seen a gun or anyone interfering with the car, and not even the key witness was questioned on this vital point. You cooperated with the police? No problem, I right? give them a statement. Did they um, ask you whether you had seen a weapon in the car? Not specifically, no. How many times did the police interview you? Uh, I was called back for a second interview, but that was specifically about the two men at the steps as to the position of their bodies and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it wasn't in relation to the motor car. But so far as you were concerned, did the police in either of their two interviews with you show any interest in your knowledge of the contents of the car and whether you'd seen a gun or not? No, not at all. On that very day, I remember people saying, quite a number of people, oh, respectable people, decent, upright people saying, if what happened was that a soldier shot these men in cold blood, they'd not be brought to book for it. And one would have to look back now and, and say, well, there were no prosecutions. So because people have seen this, you see, over and over and over the years, uh, there is a lack of confidence. In John's case, beyond any reasonable doubt, he could have been and should have been arrested. When John McNeil was killed, they had to think what they were doing before they killed John. They made sure killing the driver, the other ones definitely won't get away. That is premeditated murder, as far as I'm concerned. Anne Bradley, John McNeil's common law wife, speaks to relatives of people killed in disputed shootings. Almost all of them have been Catholics. To them, there's one law for civilians, another for soldiers, because the DPP so rarely prosecutes them. 
The problem for the DPP is that the law governing the use of lethal force is very vague. Section 3 of the 1967 Criminal Law Act says that such force as is reasonable in the circumstances may be used to arrest or prevent a crime. In Northern Ireland, the law's lack of precision has inevitably caused trouble. It could only bring the law into disrepute if you brought a number of prosecutions which failed. Then, where it's absolutely uh, in the lap of the gods, what a jury will think, or what a Diplock judge will think, uh, a DPP is going to say, well, I'm not going to initiate pr proceedings. And that seems to be the message which has gone out. So vague is the law that in practice a soldier only need say he honestly and reasonably believed the person he shot to be a terrorist, even if the victim turns out to be innocent. In 1976, the Labour government asked the House of Lords to lay down precise guidelines for the use of lethal force, but the Lords declined. The perception of that, both on soldiers and on the public, I think, is that it's all right to blaze away at someone. Uh, if you think they might commit an offence, or if you think they have committed an offence and they appear to be escaping. It's all so vague that that is construed as being a licence to kill. There's another reason why the DPP so rarely prosecutes soldiers. On the few occasions that he has, he's had to charge them with murder. The law says anyone who deliberately shoots intends to kill, and judges have been reluctant to convict when the penalty for what might have been an overreaction in the heat of the moment is a compulsory life sentence. The solution that, that I have been arguing for over the years is the, the solution of making it possible for there to be a range of charges for there to be a murder charge only where there is clear evidence that the security forces deliberately set out to kill somebody uh, when that was not justified. Then if they use lethal force where uh, perhaps some force would have been reasonable but lethal force is, is thought to be uh, disproportionate, then there should in my view be a manslaughter charge. And then finally, uh, if uh, the government were to adopt more precise guidelines in relation to the use of lethal force, if there had been a breach of those guidelines, then whoever was responsible for that breach of the guidelines would be up either on a, a relatively minor criminal charge or else a disciplinary charge within the police or the army. Since 1981, 40 IRA terrorists have been shot dead by undercover soldiers, many falling victim to carefully planned ambushes. The tactics of this undeclared war are only possible because the law is so flexible. To the army, fighting fire with fire makes good military sense, but to most law-abiding nationalists, it's morally dubious and counterproductive. Overcoming paramilitary violence is much, much more than a purely military matter. And something that might achieve a short-term military success can be in the long term damaging, extremely damaging to uh, the ultimate achievement of peace. Later the Privately, ministers recognize that some army shootings do undermine confidence in the rule of law, particularly in nationalist areas. Publicly, they've said any new proposals for toughening the law on lethal force will be given careful consideration. But that's been the government line now for some years. There's no evidence they actually intend to change the law. My suspicion is that there are uh, there are some people in the security forces and the Ministry of Defence who are reluctant to see any change in the law because the law as it stands suits the kind of policy which is being pursued by the security forces at the moment. Traditionally, the army has seen the solution to terrorism in Northern Ireland in military rather than political terms. The army fears that any change in the law governing the use of lethal force might put its soldiers at greater risk. Soldiers who've hesitated in the past have paid the ultimate price. But no change in the law also carries its price. As the law stands, soldiers have, with apparent impunity, shot people who are quite obviously not terrorists. <laughs> Two decades of violence have produced an underclass of teenagers whose sole quest for status is performing dangerous handbrake turns in front of friends.
Joyriding is an epidemic in Belfast. Some joyriders get arrested and fined. For others, the penalty is more severe. Quite a lot of people around here don't particularly like joyriders, but at the same time, they don't like to see them getting shot for like stealing a car. It's the only place probably in, in the world where young people can face summary execution for being in a stolen vehicle. It's no. madness. Last February, soldiers from the 3rd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment shot a joyrider. It happened in Lenadoon, an IRA stronghold in West Belfast. A joyrider performed a handbrake turn in front of an army jeep, then blew his horn to bait the soldiers into a chase. Moments later, they opened fire. The soldiers told the RUC they shot at the joyrider because after he narrowly missed one soldier, he swerved towards another. Witnesses dispute this. Other soldiers fired, mistakenly believing the shooting from the army jeep came from the joyrider's granada. But a witness says one soldier thought the shooting had gone too far. A soldier ran down behind the jeep and shouted tell him to stop firing. And they didn't listen, tell him to just kept firing. The joyrider was John Kearney. His car was soon hit and stalled. And the car so, pulled in where? Yeah, just there, left hand side. The, ca the car wouldn't start and it jumped out and as it jumped out they were running around the corner still shooting and just panicked and started running again because I didn't think they were going to stab shooting. As Kearney fled for his life it should have been obvious to the soldiers he didn't have a gun but they kept up a barrage of fire. But as I get halfway down I'll pop my arms up in the air and shoot don't be shooting on the edge of it I thought I would have made a stab shooting, but then over, because it's shabby when I had my arms up in the air. In all, seven soldiers fired 24 bullets in this built up residential area. There were many witnesses in the shops and flats overlooking the green, like Lawrence Robertson and his daughter Kate. Another brick came running down after him again, so I'd put another one in him. That time the fellow was trying to get up, and he shouted, I'm only a joyrider, I'm only a joyrider. Treat him as if he was a, an animal, you know. It was very careless the way they'd done it. They'd grab him by the hair and a really shot and drag him through the mud and things. It was very degrading looking, you know. My whole arm was just numb, no feeling, and my whole neck was lying open. There was a big hole in it. And I just felt, I never felt pain like it in my life, and I hope I never will again. Like. But I then said to the soldier, look, you're more experienced with dealing with gunshots than wins than us, you know, when you do something. He says, oh, I'm sorry, mate, our job's finished, we're just waiting on the RUC. One of the soldiers patted this soldier on the back and says, well done, good shooting. I mean, that was their attitude. John Kearney has been prosecuted for driving a stolen car, but no soldier has been prosecuted for shooting an unarmed man when he was so clearly posing no threat to anyone. But there's an even more disturbing case involving soldiers who are alleged to have fabricated evidence to exploit the vagueness of the law. This time, two teenagers were shot dead. And again, members of the 3rd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment were involved. This is a notorious junction in West Belfast known as Skidpan Alley. On the night of the 30th of September 1990, joyriders were performing here. Martin Peake, who'd just turned 17, was driving a stolen Astra. With him was Karen Riley, aged 18, and a friend, Markovitz Gorman, aged 16. Martin Peake and Karen Riley were both shot dead. I just lost something at the heart because he was just fell fun and laughter and he never done of no harm on himself or us. There's a day goes past where we don't expect Karen to walk through the door. And Karen was the life and soul of the family. She was the leading light in the family. And now that light's been put out, I mean we're all absolutely devastated. You know, and it just goes on and on and on. The shooting happened as the Astra sped along a darkened road. The army claims it hit a soldier at a roadblock. Paratroopers in hedgerows raked the car with gunfire over 400 yards. The only survivor, Markovitz Gorman, disputes that the driver, Martin Peake, hit anyone. 
It was just driving and then the shooting started. Like if there had been a checkpoint or there had been somebody were a red light or Marty would have said. Because he would have said, no, get down or something at a checkpoint or what will I do? He would have said something but he just didn't say nothing. And I didn't feel hitting nothing. But did he, did he perhaps swerve? Do you remember the car swerving to, as if to avoid someone just before the shooting started? No. I was just dreading and shooting. Yet again, questions arise about whether soldiers used minimum force. The shooting was witnessed by a man who'd been stopped by the army. They kept shooting that car, even though it had stopped. They kept shooting at the car. And I just, I just couldn't believe that they kept on firing. I couldn't believe that the soldiers that were beside me kept on firing as much as they did. Martin Peake appears to have survived the first barrage of fire because the Astra didn't crash out of control. It drew up neatly at the side of the road. And that suggests he was shot after he'd stopped and no longer posed a threat. His post-mortem shows he died of a shot to the side of the face. I believe my son was shot when the car came to a halt. What witnesses said, the car came to a halt and the army was still firing on it. So why? I want someone to answer me a question. Why did they keep on shooting at the car when it was hot? I looked up at Martin and he was lying over the steering wheel and I says, Marty, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? And Marty didn't answer and I looked through the two seats and Karen was lying on the back with her hands over her head and she was moving or nothing. Within minutes of these two teenagers dying here, soldiers are alleged to have faked an injury. This very serious allegation comes from an eyewitness we've traced who was along this road at the time. He doesn't want to be named for fear of reprisals by soldiers, but he's given us a detailed account of what he saw and he's been interviewed by the police several times. I've seen soldiers standing on the road and I saw one soldier hitting the other soldier on the leg or appeared to be hitting them on the leg with a gun. I thought they were having a bit of fun among themselves, you know. I think they were laughing. Well, next thing I knew, he was on the ground lying down. A few minutes after, I seen them walking down the road, and one soldier started limping like. The other soldier was trying to help him. I heard it on the radio the next day that the soldiers were hit by the car. Then I thought about this one soldier hitting the other, and I had the idea that they'd done that on purpose to cover up that the car might have hit them. I don't think the car hit them at all. It was about 10, 15 minutes later, whenever I think it was an officer came along and he asked who, who was hit. And this guy says, me, sir. And he went over, he says, where were you hit? He says, I pointed down to his, to his boot, no, down to his foot. And uh, he says, how bad is it? He says, I'm OK, I'm dead on, you know. The paratroopers who shot dead Martin Peake and Karen Riley were from the 3rd Battalion's A Company, stationed just outside Belfast. Far from any remorse, it's clear there was a sense of regimental pride over what had happened. Paratroopers built this large mock-up of the Astra peppered with bullet marks and displayed in the canteen. In the front seat was a paper mache head with red paint depicting the shot that killed Martin Peake. The caption, which no officer had seen fit to remove, read, Vauxhall Astra, built by robots, driven by joyriders, stopped by A Company. I had murdered him. I don't like him saying he murdered him. Because I just turned something so priceless off me. It's just like a big jail. <laughs> the dogs want to murder him. The grief, I mean, it's un sometimes it becomes uncontrollable, you know, especially, especially at night. You know, especially at night, when you sit up and you wait on her coming in, then you sort of realise to yourself, my God, she's not coming in, you know, and people have said to me, it'll get better, it'll get better. It doesn't, it just gets worse. None of the soldiers involved in any of the shootings we've examined has been prosecuted, and nor have any of the inquests been held, and even when they are, none of the soldiers will be compelled to give evidence as they would be in the rest of the United Kingdom. 
Nor has any government minister been prepared to discuss any of the cases or the issues we've raised in this program. The fact is that whenever security forces are involved in shootings here in Northern Ireland, a veil of official secrecy descends. Now, if there are uh, cases in which it's under dispute, or it's in doubt, or any way questionable whether the army have acted with respect to the principle of minimum force, and that they're strictly accountable to the law, then these questions must be faced, must be answered, in a way that wins confidence from the public, and specifically from the nationalist public, as well as the unionist one. Secrecy breeds rumour, and when rumour festers, it's a propaganda gift to the IRA. This is South Armagh, border country. The battle here between the IRA's political wing Sinn Féin and the constitutional nationalists of the SDLP is fierce. But the army's recent killing of a young Sinn Féin member, Fergal Carraher, in Callihanna, brought this community together. The 20-year-old, who was married with a baby son, was shot dead by soldiers operating checkpoints in the village on Sunday afternoon. His brother, Michal, was injured in the shooting and is still in a serious condition in hospital. Accounts of the killing conflict. The army claims the Karaha's car failed to stop at a checkpoint and struck two soldiers. Local people insist it had already been waved through and was moving slowly, and that no warning was given before Royal Marines of 4-5 Commando opened fire. After the funeral, the Karaha family hit a brick wall of secrecy. There's been no prosecution, the inquest may not be held for years, and the widow has been refused access to official reports. Last month, Kalihana filled the vacuum with a people's tribunal. The village rallied round by providing 500 free lunches, a constant stream of sandwiches, and a video link to an overspill audience in a marquee. There was also a public relations team to feed journalists with information. There has been no inquest opened into this matter, this particular matter that we're looking at. The only proceedings that have been issued are civil proceedings by, if I can put it this way, the family of the victims. Whether they're an actual... Leading a panel of international lawyers was Michael Mansfield QC, a prominent British barrister in civil rights cases. Intent though the juries were to follow the correct procedures of a judicial inquiry, this one failed because the army wouldn't give their version of events, and cross-examination of witnesses was not as adversarial as it might have been. Did your brother say anything else when you were in the car about, it's okay, we can drive on? No. No. All right. So you'd assumed it's perfectly all right. Now I want to ask you at this point. Did you do anything when you got into the driver's seat of the White Rover to suggest, for example, that you were about to shoot anybody? The whole village turned out to see a reenactment of the shooting. Actors played Royal Marines and Fergal Carraher, who was in the green shirt. He and the surviving brother Michal, in the white shirt, replayed the crucial moment that Michal claims the Marines waved them on their way. The message to Kali Hanna was that, having told the brothers they could drive on, the Marines inexplicably changed their minds and opened fire. The reenactment didn't offer any explanation for two police discoveries. They'd found deep tire marks and a broken indicator light supporting the army's version that Michal had sped off hitting a soldier. Without the real army's evidence, Callihanna was left with one impression, that Fergal Carraher was shot because he was in Sinn Féin. And the emotion generated by this theater only confirmed that verdict. I am left without a husband and my son Brandon without a father. I don't want any other family to go through what we are going through. Fergus' death isn't forgotten. He is still very much in our hearts. We are all proud of him. We miss him. And we will do our utmost to see that justice is done. Thank you.
All this tribunal could ever do is provide Kalihana with an emotional outlet. Amongst the audience were the real beneficiaries of this seething anger and resentment, the political leaders of the provisional IRA, like Jerry Adams. The politics of Sinn Féin uh, are very much a politics of anger. Anger and resentment and alienation. Now, there are plenty of reasons, historical and other, historical and socioeconomic reasons, for anger, resentment and alienation. The IRA very successfully exploit that for their own ends. Now, where and to the extent that these uh, feelings do not exist, the IRA will try to create them. It will try to scapegoat, particularly the security forces, and to build up resentment against them. And a, a vicious kind of circle is thereby created. Sitting alone behind the Sinn Féin contingent was the politician who competes for the nationalist vote in South Armagh, the Westminster MP Seamus Mallon of the SDLP. He urges nationalists to remedy injustices within the rule of law, but the law's failure to remedy Kalihanna causes some of his support to waver. The battle at the end of the day in the north of Ireland is the battle between constitutional politics and the, those who advocate violence, between those who believe you can change things by violent means and those like myself who are adamant that the only way it can possibly be done, done in a very lasting way, is through the painstaking political process. And this is where the government, of course, is shortchanging people like myself. Traditionally, critics of army killings have risked the wrath of the British political and security establishment. Such questions, they say, bring only aid and comfort to the IRA. But what if the criticism comes from an establishment figure who prays for the end of what he calls the incubus of the IRA? I desperately want to see this ended, and I desperately want, therefore, to, to see no security action that in any way imperils that objective. And the winning of hearts and minds is a vital part of that total process, and it must in no way be damaged. The army remains in Northern Ireland to help the police build respect for the rule of law. But that will remain a mere aspiration so long as soldiers of the Crown who are there to enforce the law are seen to be above it.